We just talked about the anatomy of your cerebral cortex. Let's talk about the blood supply. There's only three arteries that supply your cerebral cortex, and these are gonna be your anterior cerebral artery, your middle cerebral artery, and then lastly, your posterior <coughs> cerebral artery. So if we're again looking at it from the back, you have your two hemispheres. Your anterior cerebral artery will go right in between and supply the middle or the medial side. So I'll just write medial surface of cortex. How about the lateral side? How about out here? Well, your middle cerebral artery will pick up that slack. So, so of course through the lateral side. All right, lateral surface. And don't forget the lateral surface also contains your, your Broca's area and your Wernicke's area. So all right, Broca and Wernicke. So here's your lateral side. And there's a little piece in the middle and your middle cerebral artery will take care of that too. So it'll have these little small arteries that kind of penetrate deep into your brain. Kind of catch, kind of pick up that slack. So these are your lenticulostriate arteries. And I'll just write deep. So it kind of covers both sides, but you're missing something. That's the bottom of your cerebral cortex. And that's where your posterior cerebral artery comes in. So this covers the inferior surface, mainly your occipital lobe. Why is it important that we know what areas these arteries cover? Let's just recap our anatomy. You had your frontal lobe, parietal, your occipital lobe, and your temporal lobe, correct? And we said that there was a motor cortex in your frontal lobe. All right, motor. And we said there was a sensory cortex in your parietal. This was looking at it from the side. If we look at it from here, then if you take your motor and your sensory cortex, you'll notice that this lateral surface, this lateral surface, supplies the motor and sensory parts of your face and your upper limb. This deep inner part that you can't really see from the side, but this deep inner part, this medial part, supplies the motor and the sensory of your lower limb. This is why it's so important to know what areas these arteries supply. Because if you have a problem with your anterior cerebral artery, then you can't supply that medial part. You don't have blood supply here. And so what kind of deficits would you see? You'll, have, you'll see deficits in your lower limb. So you'll have leg weakness or leg numbness. If something's wrong with your middle cerebral artery, which supplies your lateral surfaces, then you're not gonna have, you're not gonna have blood supply to your lateral surface. What do low supply? Supplies your face and your upper limb. So you'll have facial droop, you'll have upper limb numbness. Understand? Let's see if you really understand. A person has a right medial cerebral artery thrombosis. A right medial cerebral artery thrombosis. What do you think would happen? They'll have left, because we said it's left and contralateral, left face and upper limb deficits. So if you understand that, you're kind of like a human angiogram. But just by reading the question stem, you can understand what particular artery was blocked. Okay? So it's very important you understand what they supply and what can go wrong if they're blocked or if there's a leak or if there's some sort of damage to these arteries. All right? Last thing I want to talk about, there's an area in between the artery supplies and we call it the watershed zone. Yeah, an area where it's not really supplied by anything. So our watershed zone, and these are particularly sensitive to ischemia. Yeah, because you're not getting supply. So, all right, ischemia. And if you have 
hypotension for whatever reason. If you have prolonged hypotension, then these zones are going to be particularly affected. So I write hypotension. And you'll see these wedge-shaped infarcts from the areas that's not being supplied. All right, wedge shape, and they'll give you all this in the question sim. We'll talk about someone that's been severely hypotensive for a long time, maybe in shock, and then start and have neuro deficits. They might ask, what area is affected? It would be your water shed zones. So, so those are your three arteries. Now, where do these three arteries come from? They come from your internal carotids, internal carotids, and your vertebral arteries. Your vertebral arteries are located in your vertebrae. That's why they're called vertebral arteries. So in your internal carotids and your vertebral arteries. Your internal carotids will go up from your neck, that's where they're located, and meet at the base of your skull. And from the base of your skull, it'll branch off into your middle cerebral arteries. Middle cerebral arteries. And it'll also branch off into your anterior. Anterior. There's an artery that kind of communicates between these two anterior cerebral arteries. We call this anterior communicating artery. So I'll just write anterior communicating. So anterior and middle comes from your internal carotids. How about this guy? How about your posterior cerebral artery? That'd be from your vertebral artery. So your vertebral arteries come out a little bit lower. And they will fuse together to form your basilar artery. And from this basilar artery, they'll branch off and make your posterior cerebro. Ah, there it is. So this comes from your vertebral artery. And there's a small artery that communicates between the posterior cerebral and the rest of the structure. We call this the posterior communicating artery. And when you bring them all together, it forms this kind of circle. We call all of this the circle of Willis. Circle of Willis. And that is how you supply your brain. All right? Now some complicated physio stuff they want you to know for some apparent reason is that they want you to know about cerebral perfusion pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure, also known as CPP. This is basically the pressure of blood that goes to your brain. And your CPP will equal your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure. That's a fancy way of saying it's affected by your blood pressure and the pressure in your brain currently. So your intracranial pressure. Just to recap of basic physics, things will go from high pressure to low pressure. Yeah? So if we want blood to go to our brain, we want, we want high bodily blood pressure and kind of lower intracranial pressure. That way it will go from high to low to our brain. If we have really high intracranial pressure and really low blood pressure, then it'll go from our brain to our body. We don't want that. And so your CPP is basically the difference of these two, the gradient of the two. And you need a gradient, otherwise it'll, you'll just kind of stop flowing. Yeah, if the pressures are equal, then there's no movement. So your CPP will decrease if you have really high ICP, so really high blood pressure kind of pushing it where it shouldn't go, or if you have really low blood pressure. All right, so these two variables kind of affect your perfusion of your brain, uh, affect that gradient that we're looking for. Perfusion is also driven by hypoxia. That's a no-brainer. If you're hypoxic, you're gonna want more blood, more perfusion to kind of get that oxygen. Your brain senses hypoxia by sensing the pressure of CO2. So if you use up all your oxygen and you don't have a lot of oxygen, you'll have high CO2. Yeah, that's your byproduct. So if you have high CO2, your body freaks out and says, I need more oxygen, I'm hypoxic. So high PCO2 will equal more perfusion. That just makes sense. 
And it also and it also should make sense that you have low PCO2, meaning you're not hypoxic, then there's really no need for that increased perfusion. You get lower perfusion. Usually, usually just because your arteries kind of vasoconstrict, you kind of reduce that pressure because you don't need it. And we can use this to our advantage. So if we have increased pressure in our brain for whatever reason, then we can make the patient high, hyperventilate. <sighs> Breathe out all that CO2, have reduced CO2. And you, then you'll start to vasoconstrict and kind of reduce your perfusion pressure, kind of reduce that pressure in your brain. All right, so that's just one way we can use it to our advantage. So I just write hyperventilate. And then lastly, because anytime we do physio, they like to pull out charts. And charts always suck. It always scares medical students, but it's not that bad. There are two charts they like to show. One of them is your perfusion versus your CO2 levels. So as your CO2 levels rise, your perfusion will rise. That just makes sense. That's what we've been talking about this last couple of minutes. Until a certain hits a certain point where it's just basically basically maxes out. Okay, so as your CO2 level rise, your perfusion will rise. That chart's not too bad. So that's your first chart. Your second chart will be the same thing, perfusion, but here will be O2. So I write 50, we'll just write whatever units, it doesn't really matter. Units, we'll say 50 pressure units, if that makes sense. 100 and then 150. And this chart is a little bit more funky. It goes like this. And I looked at this chart for a long time and I didn't realize what was going on. Then I realized the chart's just backwards, okay? This basically means that as your O2 decreases down this x-axis, you'll get hypoxic, and that causes your perfusion to increase. All right, so just flip the chart around. Fools a lot of medical students, but that's just how, how they want to ask it. All right, that is your physio for your cerebral perfusion pressure. That's all arterial pressure. Let's talk about venous for a second. What drains all this blood? Well, on your cerebral cortex, on your outside, you have all these veins and they'll drain your blood. And they'll drain it into these little cavities, these sinuses, and those sinuses will eventually go into your internal jugular vein. So all right, vein goes into sinuses, goes into internal jugular. That's just, a, that's just a pathway, all right? But before we can talk about the sinuses, which is probably the most important part, before we talk about it, I just wanna go over some anatomy of your nervous system. We said that your central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord is covered by this protective layer, the meninges. It gives a little bit of a cushion. That way your brain's not just rubbing against your skull when you're like moving around, that'd be terrible. So we have this protective layer around our brain and our spinal cord. That is your meninges. And this protective layer is made up of three membranes. So that would be your dura mater. This one's the most external one, the closest to your skull, basically. And the dura mater itself is split up into two regions. Your periosteal, meaning the one closest to your skull, like the top, top dura mater layer. And then your meningeal, meaning the one that's closer to your meninges, the bottom dura mater layer. So all right, periosteal and meningeal. And it is between these two layers where your sinuses are. The next membrane layer is your arachnoid mater. And you should know that it is underneath the arachnoid, so below, aka subarachnoid, where all your arteries are. All the arteries we've been talking about thus far is underneath your arachnoid. Also, where a lot of your CSF is. And the last layer is your pia mater. Okay, let's see if we can draw this out and decipher what I just said. So let's just say this is your skull. And this is your brain. The first layer, we said it was your dura mater. Your dura mater is made up of two layers. The periosteal, which is closest to the periosteum, your bone. And your meningeals, which is closer to your other meningeal layers. And in between, we said, is where your sinuses are. And this will drain your veins and it will also drain your CSF. Underneath is your arachnoid. And we said that 
Below your arachnoid is your subarachnoid space. And this space is where your arteries and your CSF is. So subarachnoid, all right, artery, CSF. You might ask, well, if this is where the CSF is, how does it get to the, the sinuses where it needs to drain? You have this little projection in your arachnoid called arachnoid granulations, and it just kind of connects the two and lets the CSF drain. So I write arachnoid granulations. As your arachnoid, and then last but not least, we have our pia mater, our last layer, and that covers your meninges. And that's the layer that protects your brain. So your veins will drain into your sinuses. You have a ton of sinuses. You have a big one that goes right down the middle. We call that your sagittal sinus. You have two that goes kind of outside to the side. We call this transverse. You have one that goes straight through. We call that straight sinus. And then they eventually all coalesce and drain into your internal jugular vein. Simple enough. We can call all this collection dura, because it's found in your dura. Venous, because it's draining venous blood. Sinuses, because they're sinuses. And that is how we drain the blood of our brain. And there's one thing you know, any vein can thrombose. All right, so if you're, especially if you're hypercoagulable, it can thrombose and then you just block off that venous drainage and you're just gonna have built up pressure in your brain. So you're gonna have signs of raised ICP, you're gonna have neuro deficits. So this vein is no different. Don't think it can't thrombose, because again, then one last thing I wanna talk about, there's a deeper sinus that are kind of behind your nose. So kind of like right in the middle of your, of your skull. So kind of, I can't really show you. I'm like trying to show you a 3D image, it's not really gonna work, but there's a picture in my, my notes, and we call that your cavernous sinus. So it's behind the nose, kind of drains your other veins, plus your ophthalmic veins. So the, the veins that drain your eyes. And, and next to this cavernous sinus, you'll find a lot of things that lie with it. So things like your internal carotids, you're gonna see a ton of cranial nerves. Three, four, five, V1, V2, six. All of these. Now, why is this important? Well, it's a vein, so it can thrombose. It's also right beneath, right beneath your nose. So if you have severe acne or a patient has severe acne, it can, infections can spread to it and you can have infections. And when you're affecting so many things, it's just bad news bears. One of the things they do want you to know is that six is the most often affected. Just, I'm guessing structure-wise, it's just located in a more compromising position. So six is the most affected. Now, we haven't talked about cranial nerves yet, but if you do know about cranial nerves, what does cranial nerve six do? It's your abducens nerve, or abduct. That's what the controls the lateral rectus of your eyes, and so it makes your eyes abduct. If you, so you have um, unopposed medial rectus, so your eyes will just move midline. So that would be the biggest sign, cranial nerve six being affected. But, could, but just know it can affect anything else. So you can have diplopia, varied eye movements, pain around that area, etc. cetera. The, the history will give it away, okay? So that is the blood supply, both arterial and venous, of your cerebral cortex. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.